Hello and welcome. Today we're talking about Ian Thorpe, his world records, his fabulous catch, the momentum he creates on his stroke, and also two other technical points where he was ahead of his time. We'll also talk about what enabled him to break 17 individual world records and what would have enabled him to go even faster and break even more. What strategy would he have used to do so? Ian Thorpe, it's also a world record in the 400 meter long course at 340, a world record in the 200 meter at one forty-four five Olympic titles, including three in Sydney with three world records, 13 world titles in short, a reference in swimming. Let's start with his technical analysis by his posture. What we notice is that his gaze is slightly forward at times, or even completely forward as you can see here. In terms of horizontality, he keeps his heels on the surface. So in terms of resistance to forward motion, apart from surface and wave resistance with his head, he had very few breaks uh, against him. To put it in context, at the end of the 90s, when he started his international career at the age of 14, 15, a lot of swimmers had the high heads looking forward, even though the neck was already starting to uh, realign much more flat at the start of the 2000s. So, of course, I wouldn't recommend doing the same thing because either you're going to hollow out your lower back and that's going to hurt or, or your feet are simply going to fall off because you don't have the same buoyancy as pro swimmers. So you have to adapt, you have to do things as well as possible and that means swimming with your, your neck in line, your head submerged so that you stay as horizontal as possible. Another point where he was ahead of his time was his underwaters. Whether it was after the flip turn, as you can see here, or after the start, he was already ahead of everyone else. He was already doing a few dolphin kicks, whereas that was very rarely the case in freestyle. Very few swimmers did it in those years. Nowadays it's the norm, but back in the 90s it clearly wasn't the case. But I'll talk about that later. What I wanted to talk about before was his catch. His catch clearly was one of the cleanest on the circuit. He was catching on water really ahead of the line of his shoulders. And again, it was clearly not the norm at that level before. When you look here next to him, you can clearly see the arms straight, whereas here, we're at the World Championship or at the Games. I don't know exactly which video I took, but you get the idea. You see that behind him, whether it's here or whether it's even here. What's going on? There's much less elbow fixation than we see nowadays, especially on the right arm on this side. Whereas Thorpe on both sides, he was able to really flex his forearm on the arm. The second point where he was excellent was on what I call momentum. So the moment when the hand passes the vertical of the shoulder. This is where you have a point of power, where you're the strongest to push the water muscularly, and where you have the most of propulsive surfaces oriented hand, forearm, elbow, arm, backwards, to move as much mass of water as possible towards your feet. So look at it from the front, it's exactly the same thing. Here, he inhales, then he catches, and places his hand here, vertical to his shoulder. Then, you can put your elbow at 90 degree like him, or a little more or less. It doesn't matter. It depends on the depth you want to have, the gear ratio you seek, because the deeper you go into the water with your strokes, the more water you displace but the more challenging it is muscularly. You need to find the right depth for you, bearing in mind that it may evolve as you progress. The third point he excelled at was accelerating his movement underwater. He accelerated the water intensely, strongly. This allowed him to swim with big stroke. So yes, he had an amplitude stroke, but he really trained himself to push the water progressively, to pull the water really strongly, to have a very short propulsion phase. Because what does that do? It allows you to glide longer, to place yourself much more on the edge, and therefore to reduce more and more the resistance to forward advancement. And that's why, as he progressed, the number of movements he made decreased, because he pushed water harder and harder, and he also oriented his propulsive surfaces extremely well towards his feet. And today, if you train with a lot of volume, a lot of intensity, or focus solely on the time without taking into account the number of strokes you make at each length without focus on your technique at some point the frequency is limited and if your training is too hard you will do less and less distance per stroke whereas upgrade amplitude with a better technique and pull water more and more quickly it's what's been happening with swimmers progression with ian thorpe's progression or with all best swimmers for the past 100 years they swim faster and faster with fewer and fewer strokes and therefore with more and more amplitude with a propulsion time shorter and shorter. Let's go back to the postural because look at what's happening to his shoulder roll. What's very interesting is that when he inhales, he's really on a 90 degree roll. So the resistance to forward movement is reduced to a minimum. He was also one of the first to do this, at least on inspiration. You see, if you look at the other side, he's a little less on the edge, but we all have a side we're more at ease. Okay, the roll isn't 90, but the roll is still there. And it's perfectly normal to breathe in on one side when racing because you're more comfortable on that side. But in training, that doesn't mean you can't breathe in on both sides to become or stay symmetrical on your stroke and to be as effective leaning on the right arm as on the left. If you're wondering where to start on your arm stroke, I recommend working on acceleration and front arm engagement because that's what limits the brakes. This is what will enable you to build better propulsive surfaces, including the catch, and then 
the momentum. The first thing is clearly to push towards your feet in acceleration. So to accelerate this end of movement here, to make water a little harder, to feel that muscularly you're working. And you'll see that mechanically, you'll have time to engage even more in front here, like Ian. And you'll also have time to work this arm as a projectile during inspiration too. For that, I recommend you try the magic palm. It forces you to engage the body. And it also forces some people, some feedback I get, to accelerate the water backwards more easily. Because to glide longer on each side, to reach your arm forward, you have to accelerate a little more. Now I wanted to discuss what he would have potentially done to swim even faster if he had continued competing for a few more years. Beyond those dolphin kicks, which were already huge, especially on the start, he could have used them even more on the turns, as Michael Phelps did from 2003 to 2004 onwards, leading to the breaking of Thorpe's world record in the 200 freestyle in 2007 and 2008. As you know, what I recommend in terms of dolphin kicks is that it really starts from the wrists, from the hands, because that's what directs your body. So he could have continued what he was doing in terms of technique, because that's what the best swimmers in the world are doing now. They start the dolphin kicks with their hands. This is very good because it gives the most amplitude and therefore the most propulsion as well as the most speed. By lengthening his underwaters beyond 7, 8, 9 meters, he could have gone up to 12, 13, 14, 15 meters like Michael Phelps. As a result, he could have swum even faster and broken his own world records going under 340 in the 400, something no one has yet achieved. If only by adding a single undulation to each underwater, technically what he could also have done was to realign his head a little more, put his neck a little flatter like on his inhaling, exactly like some young swimmers of the end of the 90 RSS of the beginning of the 2000s started to do it, and then in 2008 to 2012 and afterwards, swimmers submerged themselves even more in front to limit to cancel out surface resistances, wave resistances. Good to know that he was 6 feet 5 tall, 220 pounds, but wore mostly size 17 shoes. He would have done less than a minute in a 100m free kick, and as Raymond Cadeau used to say, speeds don't add up. In other words, speed, from the moment you start to propel yourself after the catch to the moment you finish pushing to your thigh, is speed exclusively on the arms. The question is, if he was wearing a 17 and swimming less than a minute over a 100 meter leg stroke, would he have lost less speed, decelerated less, and thus kept his speed more easily? Because when you see his last length like the end of an 800 meter race here, and you see the intense kick behind him, clearly like a washing machine, you really get the impression that his legs help him lose less speed when he's got his arm in front. So that's just a hypothesis. Of course, it's not transposable to most of us because we don't wear size 17 shoes, but you get the idea. On that note, even if I'm not in favor of training with legs alone, with or without a board, I'd be curious to know your time over a 100m kick to see how fast you swim and to really see the difference between him and us. So on that note, I hope you enjoyed the video and I wish you all the best for your sensory freestyle.